if I ever dare say anything like that, people get so mad at me because they they think that I'm discounting everything else. And I'm certainly not. This is just probably right. one of the most powerful tools. You you lectured at A4M mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and I was in the audience, like front and center, like, yes. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I just wanted to like, I, remember that. I just wanted to ring yeah. a cowbell every time you put up a slide because you kept going into this skeletal muscle piece. And I was like, guys, we got to. And it's just amazing yeah. to look at all the doctors at A4M and so few of them actually have good skeletal muscle, you know? And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. what is everybody missing the boat here? Like, <laughs> this is the piece. Um, can you yeah. talk about the myopathy of type one and a little, just a little bit more about how and why that happens? Yeah. So, you know, there, there are several factors, but it's, it's, it's bottom line, it's mitochondrial damage. The, the muscle gets damaged so that it, it's not as strong. You have less of it. Like it doesn't take up as much mass and there's reactive oxygen species from high blood sugar that kind of just eats away and damages the muscle. They call that myopathy. Um, and the diabetic version is, is considered quote unquote mild if you're looking at uh, diseases that have myopathy included in them. But you can reverse, the, the important part is with this type of myopathy, it can be al almost entirely, if not the majority of it reversed. So, and, and that's, you know, utilizing, squeezing your muscle, squeezing your muscle. It keeps the mitochondrial uh, cells healthy and organelles cell healthy within that muscle. So it, it has to be done. It's just as, it's just as important as giving insulin, you know, in my opinion. Amen. I hear you. I mean, I'm not a type one diabetic, but for everything else out there, if this is just as important, I, I see so many female doctors online right now, there's a big movement in the space, which I'm very excited about and I applaud them and I follow them all and I cheer them on, but they're really often, you know, estrogen's always the big conversation, right? And, and making sure, sure that menopausal women have access to hormone replacement therapy. And I'm a hundred percent for that. However, there's, they do, some of them do mention muscle and strength training. Dr. Mary Claire for sure talks about it, but there's yeah. a lot of others who just really don't and they're not driving at home. And I'm like, you guys, this is <laughs> because the reason yeah. I'm saying this is because this takes me into maybe a, the older woman, like you're, you're not, you're not very old, but you're, you're going to be in menopause one of these days. Yeah. Here. And yeah. as that estrogen drops, we become more insulin resistant and we become mm -hmm. less able to balance our blood sugars. And I can imagine this is a mm -hmm. treacherous time, a more, tre I don't mean to put fear or language yeah. in there, but a more treacherous time for the type one diabetic woman would. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's been studies looking at estrogen specifically in type ones, Estrogen, usually you give that and it dilates the blood vessel in a type one diabetic blood vessel. And I'm saying that assuming this is an unhealthy blood vessel that, you know, they haven't been taking care of their blood sugars and, and eating well and things like that. It um, shrinks it. It constricts the blood vessel. So it's the very opposite thing is happening with estrogen in an unhealthy type one. So to me, that means hormone replacement is I can't sing its praises enough, but I also think you're potentially doing sometimes more harm than good if you are just giving estrogen replacement at menopause and you're not giving the antioxidants, resveratrol, increasing CERT1, doing the sauna and, and squeezing the muscle, squeezing the muscle so there's enough muscle mass to be anti-inflammatory and control that blood sugar better you know, you potentially could be causing vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, which is the opposite of what you want. Is that true for pretty much anybody who's in a metabolically compromised state and is unhealthy? Yeah, I would say so. Absolutely. I think type ones are just the cornerstone of the, the epitome of that, you know, with uh, blood vessel unhealthiness if they're not taking care of themselves. So it's probably just showing you the average person on steroids, you know, it, not, not literally on yeah. steroids. It's a bad word to use here, but you know what I mean? Like a, a magnifying glass on that. That's so, I so agree with you. I, I often share out with my audience that when they ask, um, and I talk about this inside my course at length, I do not condone the use of estrogen in a metabolically compromised individual who has mm -hmm. particularly a lot of inflammatory body fat to lose 
because it just really mucks things up when you put it in a system like that and you don't know what pathways it's going to go down and you don't know what it's going to do to the vasculature and it just really gets confusing and so your average middle-aged woman diabetic or not type 2 or type 1 is probably sitting in that category and then we're throwing hormones at it saying no hormones are safe and it's like eh, yeah they're totally safe in a metabolically healthy person and just like GLP ones are this is where I think GLP ones are beautiful because you can start to reverse that insulin resistance and, and that metabolic dysfunction pretty quickly in someone and then sort of clean up the landscape to add in the hormones if need be and then the hormones make the GLP ones work better so I, there's utility there, you know, in using it carefully in the right population because they need the estrogen and as they're getting right. older and yet we can't always use it or expect it to do what we want it to do in a healthy, safe way if the person's sitting there in like a really deconditioned, metabolically compromised state. Um, okay, that takes me to my next thought. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Years of using insulin exogenously, right? You're injecting insulin, whether it's a pump or you're doing it with a needle and syringe. What happens to someone who's not taking really good care of themselves in that process versus someone who does like yourself? Yeah. Well, insulin, if we remember, it's, it's anabolic. So the more insulin you take, the more mass you are going to take up. So if you are not tracking that, well and not here here's i think the biggest problem back again back in my day there was insulin types called regular and nph and when you gave those types you had to eat a very succinct diet it was like six small meals a day i literally weighed my food it was very regimented and that and i really didn't go off track of that because you can't the insulin tells you what you can eat 